Good afternoon, this is Chair Ruth Richardson. Pursuant to House Rule 10.1, I call this remote meeting of the Education Policy Committee to order. The clerk will take the roll for attendance. Chair Richardson? Present. Vice Chair Hassan? Present. Representative Erickson? Uh, present. Representative Dreskowski? Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Berg? Present. Representative Bow? Representative Christensen? Present. Representative Edelson? Present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Frazier? Present. Representative Jordan? Present. Representative Keeler? Present. Representative Moeller? Present. Representative Mueller. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Scott. Representative Erdahl. Representative Waslowick. Present. Representative Dreskowski. Representative Mueller. Present. Representative Scott. Representative Erdahl. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, next, we'll move on to the minutes of March 15th, 2021. Representative Edelson, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, and I move those minutes. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Edelson. Any discussion to the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The March 15th, 2021 minutes are adopted. Uh, next, we are going to adopt uh, some corrected minutes. Uh, in this virtual environment, we've been advised to call the roll for each bill referral. We followed this procedure in our virtual committee hearings, but some of our minutes reflected the way bills had been re-referred while in an in-person environment. Uh, per Representative Erickson's request, we have updated the minutes to reflect the roll call votes that were taken. Um, Representative Edelson, uh, would you be willing to um, uh, do another motion to adopt the corrected minutes for the following dates, all of which are 2021, February 15th, February 17th, March 3rd, and March 5th. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I move to adopt those minutes. Thank you, Representative uh, Edelson. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The corrected minutes are adopted. Uh, the first bill on the agenda today is House File 1317 uh, with Representative uh, Keeler. We will be calling uh, the roll on this bill no later than 2.05 p.m. Uh, Representative Keeler, would you like to move your bill to be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes? Yes, Madam Chair, I would. Thank you, uh, Representative uh, Keeler, um, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I want to talk about House File 1317 as it was something that came up to me in the conversations that I've had with our teachers. I do talking circles in my community because teachers are so valuable to me. I know um, Representative Erickson, Representative Mueller, you all talk about your time in the classroom and how important that's been to you. Um, what this bill does um, is it, it's hearing what our teachers have been saying. We all know that to create an amazing classroom, a lot of our teachers come out of their own pockets to create this environment that so many of us have kids who learn in. Um, and so what this does, as you may know, um, there's already a teacher um, deduction of $250 that really only ends up putting about a $17 uh, reduction on their tax liability. Um, this bill, if you look at the language, is really targeted to our educators who are in their first years or in that lower pay scale as they start to set up their classroom. Um, and it makes it into a refundable tax credit so that it's actual, so their actual tax bill goes down. Um, I know that we have a long ways to go to support our teachers. They do so much. Um, and, and what I heard in my community, and maybe you have all heard in yours, is 
we have some teachers that are spending nearly a thousand dollars in their classroom every year on things like pencils, Kleenexes, learning tools, but also bins and books and things that like help our kids so much. Um, so I do have a couple testifiers here. I believe they're still able to make it. They're teachers and we all know like how schedules go. Um, and so I, I think I still have two testifiers that are here, Madam Chair, if we wanna move over to them. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Keeler. Uh, first up on uh, my list, I have Hannah Howe. Yes, good morning or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Richardson, members of the committee. My name is Hannah Howe, and I am a sixth and seventh grade social studies teacher in the Columbia Heights School District. I'm here today to speak about the classroom expenses I have covered with my own money. As a new teacher, I entered my classroom seven years ago with virtually no supplies for learning and no supplies to support a functioning classroom. I didn't have a single pencil sharpener. I didn't have any notebook paper. I had zero writing utensils and I didn't have any organization supplies. And that's just to name a few of the things I would need. As a young adult fresh out of college, I quickly realized that becoming a teacher would be more expensive than I realized and would be a challenge to balance financially with my first year teacher salary and my student loan payments. Columbia Heights is a high poverty district. On average, we receive nearly $1,000 fewer per student than children the same age in West Metro districts like Edina. That being said, the supplies I need to be an effective teacher must be purchased with my own money. One might argue that I could just adjust my teaching or be more creative with the supplies I do have rather than spend my own money. But to that, I would argue that my students did not ask to attend a school that is underfunded and they did not ask to remain part of the cycle of poverty that our current public school system has helped develop. My students deserve the same opportunities as children their age in other districts, regardless of the incomes of surrounding homes. A child's education should not depend on how much their teacher is willing or able to spend on their learning supplies. As a public school educator, I cannot honestly ask parents to provide learning materials for their children when they are already challenged with paying for their own living expenses. If the state were to fully fund public schools, I would not have to spend my own money to provide students with the education they rightfully deserve. To afford the supplies I need for teaching, the supplies I need to make my classroom function as a safe learning environment, and to provide my students with meals, yes, there are children in my school who rely on teachers for food, I have continued working a second job on the weekends and over breaks throughout my entire teaching career. As a college graduate who now has a master's degree, I never thought I would be working two jobs and devoting my income from my second job to buy the supplies I need to perform my career. Now with a growing family and increasing expenses, I have to choose between supporting my own family and devoting time to my family or continuing to work a second job to afford learning supplies for my students. This is not a choice that a teacher should be faced with and is something that could be addressed by making the necessary changes to the tax credit for teacher expenses. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, up next, uh, I have Karen Taylor. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. Chair Richardson, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Karen Taylor. I teach eighth grade English language arts at Horizon Middle School in Moorhead. Sometimes feels like I began my teaching career in another time or an alternate reality. Uh, the students I teach at 13 or 14 years old see the 90s as ancient history. Uh, though much has changed, the shortage of, shortage of resources in schools has been consistent over the course of my career. When I began teaching in Moorhead, I spent a great deal of my own money building a classroom library because I had seen research saying kids didn't read well because they didn't read enough. And they didn't read enough because they didn't have access to books engaging to them or any time set aside for them to read. 
I wish I could say that with experience, I've learned how to avoid spending my personal funds on classroom supplies. Instead, I enter a state of high alert during back to school sales in order to get the absolute best prices on items I replace annually. Books, markers, colored pencils, pens, pencils, pencil grips, lead, erasers, scissors, glue, tissues, notebooks, folders, binders, papers, disinfecting paper, disinfecting wipes, granola or protein bars, lotion, cardstock, fidgets, charging cords, now hand sanitizer, and the list grows. This has bum, be, become routine for me as it is for 96% of teachers nationwide who spend an average of $740 of their own funds during the 2019-2020 school year, according to adoptaclassroom.org. The same source reports that 45% of the teachers they surveyed said that their spending increased for distance learning. One of my personal colleagues spent over $1,000 first trying to make her kindergarten classroom safe for students to return and then to make kindergarten engaging for them during distance learning. According to the Economic Policy Institute, teachers working with students in poverty will spend even more personal funds to supply what helps their students to learn. I have five kids of my own. At present, I'm a single parent receiving no child support for the youngest two. Even so, I am better prepared to absorb the expense of restocking my classroom than the teachers around me who are early in their careers. According to the NEA, starting wages for Minnesota teachers rank 21st in the nation, 20th for teachers overall. While teacher salaries nationwide have increased 11.2% since the 2008-2009 school year, when adjusted for inflation, teachers are taking home 4.5% less than 10 years ago. One of five starting teachers works a second job to provide for themselves, try to pay off their student loans, and apparently buy supplies for their students. HF 13 seems like one way to say thank you to the teachers investing in Minnesota's kids. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, no one signed up for public testimony. If there is anyone on the Zoom who wishes to speak uh, for or against the bill, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and say so now. Okay, uh, hearing none. Uh, we will uh, move on to member discussion. And I am not currently seeing uh, any hands raised uh, at all. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, my hand raise function's not there. I'm sorry. Can I, would I be able to say something? Of course, Representative Edelson. Thank you. I apologize. Um, and thank you, Representative Keeler, for bringing this bill. Um, the teacher, Mrs. Howe, had brought up Edina, um, and, and I, I want to thank her for her testimony. I actually went to Columbia Heights for high school, so um, value her work um, and represent Edina now. And right now, Edina has uh, education funds and give and goes. They're uh, private funds that we're able to, to work to help teachers, um, as well as PTOs that do this. So, but not every district can do that. And I just, I want to thank you for this bill. It's it's really important. Um, and, and it goes to value the teachers that work so hard for our districts. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Edelson. Uh, Representative Poston. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think that Mr. Uni is on the call and I have a question for him if he would take it. Um, Mr. Uni. Yep, Madam Chair, I am here. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, Representative Post on your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Adosh, um, I'm, I'm curious if the department is, is looking at this um, and looking at what teachers are spending their own money on and considering whether or not we should be providing those supplies. Is there anything being done to look at this? Mr. Oni. 
Madam Chair, Representative Poston, just for the record, I'll introduce myself, Ado Shuni, Director of Government Relations for Minnesota Department of Education. Thank you for the, the question. I do not believe, and I'll have to go back and check on this. This is a good question. Um, I know that there is probably some research out there that shows what the spread is across different states and quite possibly in, in Minnesota. I don't think that we actually track this as this is personal expenditures by teachers, and I don't think but um, I know that we can talk to the Department of Revenue and see what the amount is that they track for those that are applying for the, for the credit and see, and see what we can get there. But I think that would either be hosted at the Department of Revenue or I can go and talk to our finance team. Representative Poston. Thank you. I, I, if, if you will just follow up on that, I would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, uh, Adosh, and um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Poston. Representative Erickson. Madam Chair, sorry, can I jump? I do have a response if I can jump. Uh, in. Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Poston, I do. So this is what I have from the Department of Revenue that they gave me in preparation for the bill when it comes to talking about um, looking back at the um, classroom supplies. And again, they're looking back way into 2011 and 2000 um 12 school year the economic policy institute found that the average teacher in minnesota spends 375 dollars of their own money in their classroom but that's again through the widespread of teachers i was trying to get it broke down um, into teachers in this in in the income range um, of how much they're they're tracking but also we've never had the opportunity to track a lot of teachers indicate that they spend more but then they don't um, keep the receipts and um, break it down in taxes because of the way that the tax credit has been set up. That's the best that I have. And, and I can look into it more too as I as I dig into the bill a bit more. Representative Poston. Thank you, Representative. Um, you know, my, my, I guess just a question or a thought, are they having to buy additional supplies that they do get some of, or are these supplies that we don't provide them at all that they need for their classrooms. And I think we should probably look at that and find that out. Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Poston, from, from the conversations that I've had, and I don't know if other people have had conversations in their um, communities, but these typically are not things that school districts supply enough of. You know, you might be able to go down to a supply closet and grab a couple markers and a couple crayons and some things, but adequately to be able to supply them for our entire classrooms and also like the bins that they need and the book libraries that they're talking about. Um, from what I have gathered in the conversations that I've had with teachers across my community and state, these are not things that are, are typically covered by the school. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Poston. Uh, Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Representative Keeler for uh, uh, this increase uh, and uh, the differences that you're making for the educator expense credit. Uh, I never had a situation like this, but I know it has happened since uh, my early days in the classroom. Uh, what we have done in our area of the state where we have active BFWs and American Legion clubs is put out an all call before school starts, not only for supplies for the children, and I tell you, we, we just collect tons and tons of, of uh, supplies for the children. But we have also uh, recommended that uh, there also be uh, another bin for teacher supplies. So staplers and pens and pencils and paper. Uh, chalk used to be popular, of course it isn't anymore. So it's markers uh, you know, for smart boards, et cetera. Uh, but you know, that's something we can look to. I, I think the credit, the refundable credit is fine. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to help uh, a beginning teacher especially. But we also need to look to our communities because they need to understand that sometimes a school budget does not a, a allow for uh, supplies for a teacher. And uh, you know, to call attention to that, you can rally uh, what I would say are the troops of uh, the BFW and the American Legion uh, in, in our communities. My auxiliary in Princeton is extremely generous in what we provide. And I know the VFW in uh, Princeton and Malacca and Onamia does likewise. So, you know, we can look to the service organizations to help 
and I think Chambers of Commerce also uh, band together. We always do uh, welcoming bags for our teachers. And I know what I've put in my welcoming bag for the new teachers in my districts are those kinds of supplies. So we can look to other methods, but I think the credit is a good move. So thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Erickson. Uh, Representative uh, Keeler, um, uh, would you yeah. like to respond? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Um, the quote comes to mind, we are more alike than we are unalike. As you mentioned that you're part of an auxiliary, I'm a part of an aux auxiliary too. And I do know that um, giving back to our communities is so important. I think this is just one of the strands of the braid that we need to support our classrooms. You know, that there's a piece that the school district comes in um, and that our community comes in. And this is that third strand that our teachers step up and provide for our kids. And so it's really, coming together collectively to provide the best education system that we can. So I appreciate your support and your suggestions are great. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Keeler. Um, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was basically just going to say what Representative Keeler just said, but I just think this is a great bill. And I think that, that it is about all of the strands coming together, the community and the state and the teachers. And I just see this as a really important way that we, the state, can support our teachers and our schools. And while it's wonderful that community organizations also provide that support, um, I think it's important just as the state to fund our schools and make sure that this money isn't coming out of our teachers' pockets. So thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Feist. Uh, Representative Keeler, I'll give you the last word on your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to everybody for listening. Again, more than anything, I wanna thank the teachers. You all have done an amazing job through this pandemic and continue to show up for our kids. I know that the costs have gone up out of your pocket. So to the teachers here and the teachers that are, walking, are watching, we value you, we see you and we appreciate you. Um, and I appreciate any support, thank you. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Uh, Representative Keeler renews her motion to re-refer House File 1317 to taxes. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Richardson. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Representative Erickson. Aye. Representative Dreskowski. Aye. Representative Bennett. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Bo. Excused. Representative Christensen. Aye. Representative Adelson. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Jordan. Aye. Representative Keeler? Aye. Representative Moeller? Aye. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Representative Poston? Aye. Representative Scott? Aye. Representative Erdahl? Aye. Representative Waslowick? Aye. Vice Chair Hassan? Madam Chair, there are 16 ayes and zero nays. Uh, thank you, Ms. Larson. Um, Ms. Uh, or Representative Keeler, rather, um, you are on your way to taxes. Uh, the motion prevails. Uh, up next, we have uh, House File 965. And members, I neglected to say at the beginning of, of the start of the hearing that we have the ability to go to 2.50 uh, p.m. today. Um, so up next, we have Representative uh, Edelson with House File uh, 965. We'll be calling the roll on this bill no later than 2.25 uh, p.m. Representative uh, Edelson, would you like to move your bill to be re-referred to the Education Finance Committee? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would. Uh, thank you, Representative Edelson. I understand that you have a DE2 uh, amendment to get the bill in the shape that you would like. Um, would you like to speak to the, the DE2 amendment first? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would. The DE2 simplifies the process. Instead of creating an individualized recovery plan, um, the DE simplifies the calls for parents to be invited to an IEP meeting for additional services to be noted on the IEP. 
It widens the time frame for inviting parents to the IEP meeting and gives more flexibilities when these meetings occur. It removes the process for districts and MDE to vet and approve any outside providers. Um, the IEP and districts typically do this already. Um, it changes the appropriation so that districts have more flexibility in how they use the funds, including the to compensate for staff to do the work. Um, and so that is the DE, Madam Chair, and I, I hope members will support. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative uh, uh, Edelson, for moving that DE2 amendment. Um, members all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The DE2 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Edelson, you may uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. House Bill 965, as amended, is the, is the answer to a dire plea to, for the support of families with children that have disabilities. When schools stopped in-person learning nearly a year ago, it marked the moment when education educational progress would come to a halt for many students with disabilities. Some children are not able to learn in front of a screen and need close assistance from an adult. Some students need consistent routines in order to participate in academic work and others need individualized therapy to build and maintain skills. This bill would ensure that students who have disabilities receive additional educational services and supports if needed to address what they lost during this pandemic. The bill uses proactive, a proactive approach to include parents, which is important from an equity standpoint. Not every parent can automatically engage um, and know that their child is going to need to address the learning loss that happened. Um, this bill would convene an IEP team meeting. It would, to address the lack of progress, it would give IEP teams the flexibility to, to determine what types of services would be most appropriate. It allows IEP teams to decide how any additional services and supports would work best for the student. It provides funding to school districts to provide recovery services using federal do dollars first. Um, I would note that the federal stimulus, and again, I, this is not education finance, but uh, passed 2.6 billion in additional special education funding. Um, so this bill has had extensive stakeholder engagement. It includes families with disabilities, MACE, MDE, Education Minnesota, um, have all weighed in, ARC Minnesota, Aut Aut the Autism Society, PACER, Minnesota Legal Aid, and Madam Chair, now I would like to move to my testifiers who I have Kim Baker, who is a parent and teacher, Megan Baker, a student, as well as Marin Holden from the Disability Law Center. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative uh, Edelson. Um, we will begin uh, with uh, Kim Baker. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, my name is Kim Baker. Um, I'm not sure my video is working. Can you your, your video is, uh, is working well. Okay, uh, please proceed. Okay, thank you. you. Press this arrow if you want to. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chair Richardson and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and in support of House File 965 regarding recovery education for students with disabilities. Again, my name is Kim Baker and I'm a special education teacher and a parent of three children with disabilities. A year ago, parents, teachers, and students engaged in an educational experience unlike anything they had ever known. Through this experience, we learned that school is more than a building and education really is a team effort. In special education, we meet at a minimum once a year for an individualized education plan or IEP meeting. At this meeting, teachers, specialists, administrators, parents, and the student sit at the table as equals and make a plan that meets the needs of the student. Many of the school personnel at an IEP meeting have provided services to the student for several years and have developed a relationship with them. As someone who has sat on both sides of that table, I learned early on that the team aspect of special education is the power behind what makes it work. Each voice provides a unique perspective on the needs of the student. The team reviews progress and sets goals based on the identified needs of the student. These decisions are made through careful consideration of many factors, not only test scores and academic progress, but social skills, emotional regulation, organization, self-advocacy, and communication skills. The IEP team looks at the whole child, not just one part, and develops a com comprehensive plan to address all of the needs. Teams have worked tires tirelessly to adapt to various transition and disruptions due to COVID-19, 
but our students have very unique needs that are not easily met in a distance learning format. It is vital that the IEP team be granted the right to make educational decisions for the student with regards to any recovery services that may need to be provided so students can continue to make progress. They are the individuals that know the student best. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and up next, uh, I have uh, Megan Baker, and I think you're sh sharing the same Zoom. Uh, yes. please, int <laughs> please introduce yourself for the uh, record and proceed with your testimony. Sorry about that. <laughs> there you go. Good afternoon, Chair Richardson and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today in support of the House File 965 regarding recovery education for students with disabilities. I'm Megan Baker. I'm a sophomore in high school and I get special education services under EBD for my mental health. I'm here to ask for some much needed support during the pandemic. Distance learning is very hard for so many people and getting the support that our students need is very important as we move forward in an uncertain future. Many students have struggled to get support they need during the pandemic. There is often a lack of communication between students, teachers, and parents. With teachers using different apps to submit assignments and do work, it makes doing work very confusing, which makes students fall behind. As a result of the pandemic, many programs, including extracurricular activities, have been offered extra funds to support students and parents alike. But I feel like the special education program doesn't get the same amount of support as everyone else, when we need it just as much as everybody else. I am very lucky to have a lot of support, but a lot of kids in the program don't have the support to succeed. It's not just about the grade slipping. If these kids don't feel at their best, their work isn't going to be either. There are a lot of creative ways to meet their individual needs, so everyone gets support during the pandemic and not just the small handful of kids coming into school. I hope committee members consider what this bill means to the whole community and how helpful it would be to all the students in the district. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, testimony. And uh, we have uh, the final author testifier, Marin Holden. Thank you, Chair Richardson uh, and members. My name is Marin Holden and I'm an attorney at Legal Aid, which includes the Minnesota Disability Law Center. Thank you so much, Chair Richardson and committee members for your time hearing this bill. And thank you to Representative Edelson for your leadership on it. As you all know, COVID-19 has been extremely disruptive to schools and students, and this is especially the case for students who have disabilities. Uh, advocacy organizations, we've been overwhelmed with stories about the challenges students have faced, and you will see many of these stories in the materials for today. Um, stories of a student who was excluded from general education distance learning classes because they didn't have the support that they needed, and instead is doing less than 20 minutes of a day of school services, a kindergarten student who missed out on OT, speech, developmentally adaptive PE, and as a result, isn't ready to move on to first grade. So he'll likely miss out on a year of transition services at the end of his public school career. Um, one parent reports that their son has lost extremely valuable time. For some, the setback may be simply a loss of 14 weeks. For us, it sets us back a couple of years. Despite tremendous efforts by teachers and schools, many students with disabilities simply haven't gotten what they needed over the past year and some have regressed. House Bill 965 would help students who have disabilities make up for what they've missed by ensuring that IEP teams can collaborate to determine if a student has struggled due to pandemic disruptions, and if so, how to best provide services and supports to help the student make up lost ground. The DE is the project of extensive collaboration with stakeholders, and we think this is a good approach. It streamlines recovery services into the IEP and ensures parent involvement as parents know their kids really well. Uh, some parents have spent the last year with their kids 24 seven. It's proactive and doesn't depend on families reaching out as some families are more likely to seek out additional services for their kids and we don't wanna leave anyone behind. Um, and it allows districts and IEP teams to consider a range of additional services and would provide flexible funding for them, prioritizing the use of any available federal funds. Thank you so much, Representative Edelson, for your leadership on this bill, and I, I hope the committee will advance this legislation. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we have uh, two public testifiers signed up to testify. First on the list is Caitlin Snyder. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Caitlin Snyder, representing Education Minnesota. In her introductory remarks, Representative Edelson referred to extensive stakeholder engagement on this, so I just wanted to speak in support of the collaboration that there has been between Education Minnesota and legal aid, um, really productive conversations. We had a couple of quest questions on the bill as it was first introduced, largely on timeline, um, but those concerns have been addressed in the DE. So thank you to Ms. Heldon and Representative Edelson for some very productive conversations. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Decca uh, Farah. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Richardson and committee members. Uh, my name is Decca Farah, and I live in Egan, Minnesota. I'm a parent of two small children, ages seven and four, one of whom is autistic. He has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, and a language impairment. Um, before COVID, my son, the seven-year-old, was learning to say words like Egan for where he lived, his name, and his age. He was also learning how to draw vertical lines while sitting in for 10 minutes. That was huge for him. It may seem like a very small and easy thing, but unlike a neurotypical child, let me tell you, my son worked hard for countless days with multiple therapies to be able to do that. These are just some of the things he was doing before COVID and distant learning. At first, we did try distant learning. We scheduled Zoom sessions in hopes that we can continue his pro progression. But despite uh, our best efforts, Haroon struggled with distant learning. Sitting still was hard for him. Sitting still in front of a computer was impossible. He became frustrated and I became demoralized. My son needs and thrives with physical proximity and one-on-one -on -one with teachers and staff to learn. My son has a lot of trouble staying focused and working independently due to his multiple disabilities. Distant learning has not been a good fit for my child. He has regressed in this aspect. All of the language and social skills we worked so hard to build over the years almost vanished within months. In order to make up for the ground we lost, I'll have to reach out to the school, ask for Haroon to be reassessed to figure out how much he has regressed during this pandemic. Not every parent can do this. This is an equity issue. Some children would receive these services sim simply because their parents have the time, resources, and knowledge to advocate uh, for them, and others will not. If we rely on families to reach out to schools, only the families with the most access and most resources will do so, leaving families without access even further behind. I'm asking for your support for House File 965 for Recovery Education. Making up for what has been lost during this past year would be impossible, but this bill would provide a start by making sure that families like mine have a place to start. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony and for sharing your family story with us today. Is there anyone else logged into the Zoom who wishes to speak for or against the bill? Hearing none, we will go to member uh, discussion. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Adelson, for this uh, proposal, uh, especially the uh, DE amendment. Uh, you may get some questions from other members of my team in regard to uh, concerns, but uh, I'm really glad to see this because in October, Representative Cresha and I wrote to the governor and said, you know, if children can be in daycare at schools, then why in the world aren't our special education children in an in-person setting? Because they are really, really getting hurt from this uh, distance learning uh, setting that as, as the parent just described, does not work for them. I, I heard all the time from my parents. And so, uh, you know, to have a recovery uh, a proposal like you have here is really important. Uh, I do have a question, though, about um, lines uh, in the DE uh, 2.20 uh, in um, this would be a section, a subdivision two of special education services and supports. To whom does um, the IEP starting in line 2.19, the IEP team may determine that providers in addition to school district or charter school staff are most appropriate to provide the services and supports described in paragraph A. To whom are you referring in uh, 
that uh, phrase providers in addition to school district or charter? Is that non-public or private? Can you fill us in, please? Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Edelson. That's a great question. Um, the, that that specific um, talking about providers that may not be within the school uh, may be uh, somebody that the district has uh, contracted with. Um, that maybe they are not able to fill that specific need within the school. But like we at e any Dyna, we contract with Fraser or um or we can't we, you know, we look at different providers to to supplement what our students need in within our school. And so this would uh, allow districts and, and many um IEP teams and districts already have uh, those contracts, um, but it allows just it makes that explicit. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Representative Adelson, you're not covering non-public to whom we also, you know, make sure that we have uh, special education services provided. Is that correct? Representative Adelson. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Ayer, I think I need clarification on what you mean. Representative Erickson. Well, uh, by law, uh, uh, you know, children who attend a non-public uh, school receive special mm -hmm. education services. So does this recovery mm -hmm. not cover them or does it cover all of our children who are special needs wherever they might be enrolled? Representative Edelson. Madam, Madam Chair, it would cover a public school or a charter school. So that's, that's specifically what the bill is aiming to, to address is, are those students specifically. Representative Erickson. Well, uh, I'll, I'll look into this further. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have a, a concern here about, you know, we want recovery to be for all of our children who are uh, in a special needs programs and have IEPs. Uh, but I'll, I'll follow up on that later. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Representative Erickson. Uh, Representative uh, Edelson, were you about to- I was just going to say, oh, sorry. Madam Chair, I can follow up with Representative Erickson after the committee hearing as well on this to get clarity, clarity around that issue. Uh, thank you, Representative Adelson. Um, uh, members, we've got a couple of hands up and just as a reminder that we'll be um, having um, uh, time certain for action on this bill at 225, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Edelson for bringing this forth. I think we all know special ed students were hit much harder by the uh, school shutdowns and lack of in-person learning. So we need to do things to, to help them regain that lost learning. I do have a question, um, and th this may have been fixed in your DE amendment, and excuse me for my extra cat here that is joining our meeting. Um, get my mind back here. So the DE amendment may have fixed this and, and that will be my question. But originally um, a month or so ago, I did have some local uh, superintendents and school leaders approach me with concerns about the timing for the IEP meeting. And especially uh, we have a Southern Minnesota Education cons Consortium for our districts in this area um, that provide level three schools for students and all these kids are on IEPs. And so they were very concerned with needing to get these IEP meetings uh, done and, and getting them done in a decent amount of time. It just logistically was going to be impossible for them. So I'm just wondering if that's something you've had discussions with our school districts and some of these specialized schools and if that's been fixed. Representative Edelson. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Bennett. Thank you for bringing that up. And I think that's an important highlight that you're, you're addressing. Um, we did move um, the IE, we adjusted the, the date and the turnaround on that to ensure that we did give districts enough time after getting some feedback. We moved it to December 1st of 2021. So hopefully, um, please do circle back with me though. Hopefully that works for your district. I, we, we do um, want to make sure that it is something uh, at that time that districts are able to do. But usually by, I have two children that have special needs and usually by December, um, a lot of districts are making sure that's done. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Edelson. I appreciate you working with them, and, and I will uh, check back with them, but it sounds like you've gotten that taken care of, so appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Uh, Representative uh, Poston. Uh, Madam Chair, I was just going to make some comments, but it really referred to the last bill. Um, I can be very quick, but 
Representative Erickson talked about community and involvement. And for some of you that know me know that one of the things I do when I'm not in the legislature is I uh, am the founder of a humanitarian food aid organization called the Outreach Program in the Brainerd Lakes area. And we last year packed a million 200,000 meals and approximately 750,000 of those went to schools in about a hundred mile radius of Nisswa. Uh, they went into backpack programs. They went on school bus deliveries to families that needed food and didn't have enough food. Um, we do um, a collection for school supplies like Representative Erickson talked about and we get a great turnout for that. But we also found out that teachers are buying kids snacks. And those are kids that their parents can't afford to bring them, to send them to school with snacks. So when the other kids are having snack time, you know, the kids that their parents can't afford to send snacks were going without. So we provide snacks to schools, a lot of schools up in our area. And the really interesting part about it is we've got corporate partners like Target and Costco and Cub Foods that help us with that. So community is very, very important to schools. Thank you, Thank Representative you. Uh, Poston. Thank, um, thank you. Yeah, uh, we have uh, one last question. And just as a reminder, we're going to action on this bill at 225. Representative Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, I was, uh, Madam Chair, I'm being new to the Education Committee. I'm, uh, of course, acquainting with some of the, uh, the language and the approaches. Um, can someone help describe to me what, and maybe this is what Representative Erickson was talking about, lines 2.13 to 2.16 mean? So, so uh, what that's meaning is they can do full-time distance instruction and still receive the full-time compensatory money for those those pupils. Is that is that? Um, it seems to me the school is going to acquire less responsibility here and less um, less uh, uh, expense, uh, and we're going to continue giving the same amount of money. Is that is that what I'm reading? Um, Representative uh, Edelson, um, uh, we will uh, answer this and then we'll move to action on the bill. Uh, would you like to uh, answer this question or um, do you have someone else that would speak to that? You know, uh, Madam Chair, I am actually going to let uh, Ms. Holden address this because I actually think she, we, I was just texting with her to see if she could address Representative Erickson's question too, because she, that was a, also a good point that Representative Erickson brought up. So, uh, Ms. Holden, if you could answer. Ms. Holden. Thank you, Chair Richardson, and thank you for the questions. Um, I'll start just briefly to Representative Erickson, your question. There are non public school students who um, have individuals education plans through their public school district. Minnesota public school districts do have obligations to provide special education services, even to students who are enrolled in non-public schools. And I think that this language would all continue to apply to those students to whom those public schools are providing services to non-public students in the same way that it would apply to their own enrolled students. It's a great question and I'd be happy to discuss it further with you. Um, to Representative Dres Dreskowski, I, um, lines 2.13 to 2.15 um, are addressing just the, the types of services that students who have disabilities may be presenting upon um, return to school from the pandemic. And as I, I think I understand your question, the point of this is not necessarily to duplicate services during distance learning, but knowing that students who have disabilities, as some of the testifiers alluded to, um, maybe really regress significantly due to the nature of their disability and how it impacts their development that now when it's like if they're in it, if the school's offering them in person services now that child may need a boost of services to get back to the position where they can join class with their peers, or to make up from some of the progress that they that they lost and so and um, that could, you know, students who have disabilities who have IEPs have those individualized education supports to help them be in a position to make progress educationally and academically in school. And those needs can be in a lot of different areas. And that's what I understand 
2.13 to 2.15 to be addressing. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Holden. And uh, I know that Representative Edelson has agreed to be a resource post uh, the hearing as well for additional questions as this has got another stop. Uh, so with that, Representative Edelson, I will give you the last word. Uh, Madam Chair, this is a good bill and I, I, it has bipartisan support in the Senate and I hope that we can move it here in the House. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Edelson. Representative Edelson renews her motion to re-refer House File 965 as amended to the Education Finance Committee. The clerk will take the roll. The chair votes aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Representative Erickson. Aye. Representative Dreskowski. No. Representative Bennett. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Bow, excused. Representative Christensen. Aye. Representative Edelson. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Jordan. Aye. Representative Keeler. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Representative Poston. Aye. Representative Scott. Representative Erdahl. Aye. Representative Waslowick. Aye. Representative Scott. Sorry, aye. Madam Chair, there are 17 ayes and one nay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Larson. Um, thank you, Representative Edelson. Uh, the motion prevails and you are on your way to uh, education finance. Uh, up next, uh, we have another bill from Representative Edelson, House File 1644. We will be calling the roll on this bill no later than 2.45 p.m. Uh, Rep. Edelson, uh, would you like to move your bill to be re-referred uh, re to the Education Finance uh, Committee? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to move the bill to Education Finance. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Edelson. Um, uh, as I understand it, you have an amendment on this bill as well? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to move the DE2 in, in front of members. And what this what this amendment does is uh, it removes pretty much every section of the bill except section one uh, of the of the initial bill. It removes every section, but section two C and section four, and then it also adds a working group. Um, and so, if we could adopt the amendment, I would be happy to speak to members about the bill. Uh, thank you, Representative Adelson. Um, uh, Representative Adelson moves the DE2 amendment to get the bill in the shape that she would like. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Uh, the DE2 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative uh, Adelson, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to try to keep this pretty short because I know there's several people that want to testify today. Um, so what this bill does is uh, Section 1C of the bill as amended would allow some flexibilities for districts around what we know as uh, seat time. It, this allows a little bit more innovation in terms of the hours in, of instruction. Um, section 2 of the bill uh, provides the distinct distance learning uh, instruction, um, and it provides some definitions uh, as dist dist distance instruction is not in the current uh, statutory language. Um, right now, I have been working with stakeholders, um, the School Board Association, AMSD, Ed Minnesota, the Superintendents Association, Rural Schools, Ed Allies, and MDE. Um, all to try to come to language that would work for districts to extend the distance learning option 
for one more year for the 2021-2022 year. Um, and in doing so, uh, we would have a working group that would meet over that over this next year and report to the legislature on what works, what hasn't worked, um, and really to be able to, I mean, this has been a tough year, but what we know is what we heard from the last bill is how distance instruction did not work for a certain population. What we also know is that it really has worked well for some populations. In fact, um, in checking with uh, MDE, um, right now we have independent school districts, 25 are currently approved, and under review are 25 independent school districts. Uh, Madam Chair, the concern is that we will have uh, MDE flooded with trying to approve online applications. Um, and then what, what ends up happening is if we do not approve those online accreditations in time, um, that students that would that are open enrolled within a district would actually not be able to take those courses online, only students that live within the district. So there's lots of complications. Um, and I, I do think, you know, there's a lot to be learned over this year. And, and I think all the stakeholders really want to preserve what we can. Um, I would like to highlight and, and Representative Erickson, um, my apologies. Uh, I had thought your bill, your DE said something, it did not. Um, and so my apologies on that. Uh, but Representative Erickson and our Republican colleagues actually had a distance learning option too. I think that they probably also note that there has been uh, some things that have worked over this last year. So Madam Chair, I would like to move to my testifiers. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Edelson. Um, up first, I have Salma Abdi. Uh, please um, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Richardson and members of the committee. Um, it's wonderful to see you guys all on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. My name is Salma Abdi and I'm a Congressional District 1 representative on the Minnesota Youth Council. Um, I'm also a junior in high school and the past year I've seen the effects of online learning and it has become abundantly clear where the positives and of course the negatives lie. However, with the positives, it has introduced a brand new environment for students and it is reinforcing the idea of making the education system cater to different learning styles. For example, I'm the type of person who can learn things on their own for specific for specific subjects. I mean, not physics though, but you know, I like doing that. I like learning things on my own. And I like to learn things in new innovative ways, but I also know that doesn't work for some students. This bill would help me, but also for students who are visual, auditory, physical, or social learners, would call learning online is an issue for them, but it allows parents and families to choose their own learning model. That's why House File 1644 will be transformational to our education system as we see it, because it has given us time to sit back and analyze what has been going well and what hasn't in school. I'm additionally also a PSL student, and I've had the opportunity to take classes both completely online, strictly over Zoom and hybrid. And I truly enjoy being able to choose what type of classes I take for different subjects especially because subjects like government come easier to me and I can spend less time in the classroom and I have more time to do things I'm passionate about. See, if we were in person right now, I wouldn't be able to testify because what would be the point of driving two hours, speaking for two minutes and driving back two hours on a highway? See, this bill opens doors and opportunities for students where we don't have to give up our education or the things we're passionate about. For example, yesterday, I mean, I'm not passionate about the ACT. I'm sorry, Ms. Abdi, I'm, I'm gonna have to move on to other testifiers. We have a number of testifiers. So if you could finish up, please. Awesome, okay. Yeah, so this bill is transformational because it gives students the responsibility to both would call it take their education in their own hands learn online but also take classes in person which is why i urge you guys to support ahf 1644 because it will move our education system towards a more equitable system thank you thank you for your testimony up next we have eric lee Um, good afternoon, Chair Richardson and members of the committee. 
Um, my name is Eric Lee, and I'm a sophomore at Egan High School. I am also a member of the Minnesota Youth Council, which is a diverse group of 36 high school students who are representatives of each congressional district in Minnesota. We help bring the voice of youth to lawmakers and strive towards equity in various areas that affect youth across the state, such as environmental justice, juvenile justice, etc. I'm glad here to be here to support Representative Edelson's bold education and learning changes that forefront and increase online learning among all students in Minnesota. Despite minor negatives, I think there are multiple reasons why I think online school is just as good as an alternative for learning as in-person school. First, online learning is more engaging and can teach behavior skills. Many people say it decreases social interaction with friends, but after school, you can still hang out with your friends and go to certain things such as sports practices, etc. But through online studies, and learning, a study from CSU San Bernardino found that online students are less intimidated about participating during classes compared to in-person school learning, which increases interaction between students and educators. I personally am an introvert, but online learning has been extremely good for me, as sometimes if I feel uncomfortable, I can just turn off my camera and talk to educators as well as professors in a more comfortable way. Second, I think online education is extremely flexible as lots of work is done asynchronously. These can help you easily watch lectures that are recorded to catch up to class, as well as make sure that other responsibilities and activities are taken care of by doing your homework or assignments earlier. I personally am extremely busy because of major extracurricular activities, and I know many of my friends are as well, and they would love to support the idea of not only gaining vital time management skills, but also having a more stable life in general by allowing you to schedule things ahead of time or just schedule your homework in general. In light of these reasons, I fully support an increase in online education as an amazing alternative to in-person learning and an option that many schools can offer. And that would be guaranteed by HF 1644. And, and because Mr. of this- I'm gonna on, ask you to also wrap up your testimony yeah. as well. And on behalf of the Minnesota Youth Council, thank you Chair Richardson and members of the Education Policy Committee. These new laws will help create better schooling, learning and curriculum changes that can help Minnesota youth and prevent disproportionate life impacting consequences in their future. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Uh, Lucy Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I am Dr. Lucy Payne, Matamid High School Board Chair and faculty at the University of St. Thomas in the School of Education. In the interest of time, I'm going to summarize my written comments that have been submitted to you. This bill allows us to think beyond what we can do now and imagine what we could do and be for all learners. It opens the door to ask a good kind of what if questions. What if the redefinition of instructional hours has potential to allow us to reconsider what if we could offer credit recovery in the moment in high school before students failed? What if students could participate in service learning and be an integral part of their communities while still in high school? What if we could offer authentic career exploration through internships and capstone projects? What if we could personalize learning for each student? This bill would remove a barrier and allow districts to explore answers to these questions and begin to implement models and practices that meet the needs of our students. There have been many different education organizations working together on this language, and we will continue to work collaboratively to improve the language during the session in the best interest of students, teachers, and schools. I ask what if, because I believe our teachers and our administrators can and want to find innovative ways to meet the needs of learners while still meeting Minnesota academic standards. So please ask yourselves, what if we could redefine instructional hours? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Payne, for your testi uh, testimony. Uh, up next, we have uh, public testifiers, uh, starting with uh, Steve Truen. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Steve Truen, Director of Teaching and Learning from School District 196 at the Rosemont Capital Valley Egan. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, this afternoon. I'm speaking directly to the distance learning portion of the proposal. And I'm um, here on behalf um, also of AMSD and MASA and MSBA as well. Um, looking at uh, that, that portion of the bill, I offer my strong support. Uh, there are a number of districts in the state that went through this process um, with MD in line with statute to be online providers prior to this school year. And then all districts were thrust into um, different versions of online learning over the past 12 months, as you know. Uh, in our district, um, at the start of last school year, we had about 30% of our families that chose our distance learning option. Mid-year, after our return to in-person, it's down to about 25%. Uh, we also, while we're managing the in-person return and the models that we have going right now, we're putting energy into next fall 
and planning and staffing and trying to be responsive to the needs of our um, community. Uh, we reached out to our families and asked um, if they would be wanting or desiring an online option in our district for next fall. And uh, last month we got responses back, about 3% of our families expressed interest, but in our district that's 880 students currently that said that they are choosing that option in our district for next fall. So we're working to develop a, uh, a model built on everything that's gone well this year, the best of what's gone well in distance learning and creating that option for them in the fall. Uh, as we do that, there's also a pretty extensive process currently in line with statute um, to um, apply to MDE as an online provider, which is taking a, a significant amount of human capital. I also know that MDE is, um, is being flooded and will be flooded with applications from a variety of districts. Some districts have already applied and um, some districts are on the verge of applying and submitting it real soon as we are. Um, so we're working on our, our program development and our application. And quite frankly, I would say about half of our families that are interested right now are doing it out of watching the pandemic conditions. If the pandemic wasn't still in the current area of flux and unknown for next fall, they probably would join us in returning in person, but there's a lot of unknown. So there's a one year kind of gray area. And what I like about this proposal, it does offer that one year extension of distance learning and which would allow districts to- and Mr. Try. Tron, um, I, I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up. Uh, we do have other sure. testifiers. Absolutely. So this would allow districts to offer and be responsive to their families and then make a decision um, during next year, if they want to move forward and be an official online provider and go through the application process, it does provide that interim um, uh, or interim opportunity for districts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, up next, we have Caitlin Snyder. Madam Chair and members, my name is Caitlin Snyder representing Education Minnesota. I had intended to start my testimony today talking about some of the benefits of distance learning, but I think representatives Abdi and Lee explained that a lot better than I can. So I'm going to focus my testimony on two parts of the bill that we are still having ongoing conversations about. Um, and first, I'd like to commend the collaboration and leadership of Representative Edelson and Mr. Uni on this bill. It's been a lot of um, conversations on getting people to the table. Um, so specifically on instructional time, I had a really great conversation with Dr. Payne the other day. Um, appreciate the intent. Um, as members know, under 122A.16, a qualified teacher needs to be providing, needs to be overseeing um, courses for credit, especially in the high school. So we need to figure out what, how that language would work in that area specifically. On the distance learning provision, we've had some um, really substantial productive calls um, with the other stakeholders and Representative Edelson and Mr. Uni on this. Uh, there are two um, discussion points that we have on in front of the table at, the, at this moment, including um, the prep time for teachers. Um, switching to a distance learning model is not just doing your normal lesson plan, but in front of a camera, keeping that student engagement is really um, necessary and vital for the success of this program. And then also class size, again, on the engagement you can't engage 100 students um, online. Um, so having those two items under discussion are, are, are part of our focus at this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Snyder, for your testimony. Um, is there anyone else on the Zoom who wishes to speak for or against the bill? Uh, hearing none, we are past our time. We are, uh, Mr. Looney. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, uh, thank you for indulging me. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I just wanted to, on behalf of the department, just uh, thank all of the stakeholders for um, coming to the table to discuss this as an option. We've heard from many of the testifiers uh, about the benefit that this would provide, but we also really wanna be sure that we're providing the appropriate guardrails um, for this. So we, ultimately, we really wanna have this done right. On the one provision, the other provision that remains outside of distance learning hours of instruction, the department still needs to talk with internally with staff about that. Um, but we understand other conversations are happening with stakeholders, so we're happy to engage with them as well as as well as the author on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Oni. Um, as I mentioned, we are past the time certain for the the roll uh, the roll on this. Um, uh, vote. Uh, we have, uh, we'll, we'll have one uh, question from Representative uh, Dreskowski. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds uh, to formulate your, your question. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, to make sure my mic was on. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the goal of this bill is good. I, I don't I don't understand where the additional money is required, though, is it? I'm guessing maybe that's a culture in the education committees. You just put an appropriation on each bill, but um, this is something, these are all employees who, uh, as I understand, are supposed to be supporting the student in the district. I think the idea to be deliberate about connecting them with the parents of the student is good, uh, but I don't, re I don't understand uh, the need to uh, place a blank appropriation out there. Maybe Representative Edelson can shine some light on it. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Dres Dreskowski. Uh, Representative uh, Edelson, um, uh, your response, and then we'll go to your last words. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Dreskowski. It won't be a, it will, will not be a blank appropriation. Um, if there is any cost, it would be inconvenient the working group, and none of the members of the group would be um, uh, paid for their their um, time. Um, so, I guess if there is a cost to this bill, it would be rather minor. Hopefully, that I can Representative Dreskowski happy to speak with you offline about this further, since we don't have much time. Thank you, Representative Edelson. Uh, last words on your bill. Uh, Madam Chair, this has been a tough year, um, but I think that there are things that I want to make sure if, if we've learned them, uh, that we keep and retain what works and we get rid of what doesn't. So I ask for member support. Thank you, Representative uh, Edelson. Uh, Representative Edelson renews her motion to re-refer House File 1644 as amended to the Education Finance Committee. Uh, members, if you could unmute, the clerk will take the roll. The chair votes aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Representative Erickson. Well, my eye is based on the fact that we need to keep working on this in finance. So I hope that the representative will do that. Representative Dreskowski. No. Representative Bennett. Aye. Representative Berg. Aye. Representative Bow. No. Representative Christensen. Representative Edelson? Aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Frazier? Aye. Representative Jordan? Aye. Representative Keeler? Aye. Representative Moeller? Aye. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Representative Poston? Aye. Representative Scott? Aye. Representative Erdahl? Aye. Representative Wozlowick? Aye. Madam Chair, there are 17 ayes and two nays. Uh, thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, the motion uh, prevails. And thank you, Representative Edelson. You are on your way to the Education Finance Committee. There being no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.